On December 3rd, 2025, a critical React security vulnerability was announced, which led to exploits within minutes. However, this exploit is very hard to understand, and there's a lot of confusion in the community about what happened. A lot of people think that this is because there is back and forth communication between server and client, and that's what caused the vulnerability. When you look at the React exploit POC, it's not that easy to understand as well. So in this video, I'm gonna break through this confusion and help you understand the POC, break it down. I've spent so much time trying to understand this exploit, and I'm gonna break this down for you. So if this doesn't make sense to you, it will by the end of this video. If you're new here, welcome. I'm Shruti Kapoor, and I'm here to make react easy for you to understand but also get started and thrive in this community so if that is something you're interested in keep watching and hit that subscribe button let's go first up let's talk about the vulnerability itself if you take only one thing from this video let it be that you need to update your packages immediately especially if your app supports react server components this vulnerability called cv 2025 5i182 has a level of cvs 10.0 which stands for common vulnerability security score which is the highest level of score that a vulnerability can get, which means you got to stop everything and update your packages right now. The packages that are affected by this are Webpack, Parcel, and TurboPack. Also, there have been two new vulnerabilities reported since, which is denial of service, a CVSS of 7.5, and a source code exposure of CVSS 5.3. I highly recommend check out the React blog post and make sure that your components are updated. Okay, now that our packages are updated, Let's actually understand what happened. To understand the exploit, let's actually take a look at the code that was submitted for POC of this by Lachlan Davidson. So this is the code that was submitted by Lachlan Davidson to show the vulnerability in React server components, React Flight Protocol. Now, if this makes no sense to you and it seems like a bunch of gibberish, don't worry, we're gonna break this down to understand. To understand React server components, let's actually take a step back and understand how server-side rendering works and client-side rendering works. We have the server and the client. What happens on server-side is that on the server, we generate the HTML and then send this data over to the client. So the client just has to display the HTML page. Now, one problem with this is this is good for static sites where the content can be pre-built ahead of time and can be just displayed on the client side, but it lacks interactivity. The other side of the spectrum is the client-side rendering. In client-side rendering, the server sends JavaScript to the client and then the client has to do the job of converting JavaScript to HTML and then it can render that page. Now let's talk about React server components. How is it different? So in React server components, the server actually doesn't send JavaScript, but it sends something that is a JavaScript to React Lite protocol object. Now this is a funky looking object and this is what this gibberish in the POC looks like. This is the payload, the React Flight payload. The way this works is that on the server, we convert JSX, which is the component that we wrote, which would we would have initially written on the client, into a React Flight payload. And when the client receives this payload, it deserializes this on the client side and then gets the HTML out of it. On the client side, we get this React Flight payload and get the JSX or actually the HTML out of it. I know this is very complicated, so we're going to deep dive into it in one second. But just remember that the React server components pipeline is we have a JavaScript component. This is on the server side. We serialize it using render to pipeable stream. This is the function that is used to convert a JavaScript into a React flight payload. The payload looks something like this, which is what the POC looks like too. And on the client side, we actually deserialize this payload using create from fetch and then we have our HTML. This is a slide that I got from a Git Nation conference. I'm going to leave the link in the description. Amazing talk. Do check it out if you want to understand React Server Components in detail. But okay, this looks fine. Let's take a look at it in action. To help you understand React Server Components, let's actually take a look at React Server Component in action using Next.js. Now I'm using the app router, which is the default in Next.js, which by default uses React Server Component. Okay, so here's a simple React Server Component. So far, all I have on the page is I've got a message that comes from get message in here, which is actually being called on the server. In Next.js, everything by default is called on the server. And from here, I'm just returning a simple JSX. If you notice here, I'm having an H1 and H1 here, which should not happen. So let's change this to H2. You should not have two H1s on a page. Okay. So now I've got React Flight demo held from the server. Cool. This is simple. This is no big deal. So I've added a simple promise here with a timeout of 12 seconds, which basically takes too long. And then once it's done, I'm going to return a JSX of hello from the server after 12 seconds. And if we look at the logs, actually, you'll notice that it starts creating a promise on the server, but then it's going to wait for 12 seconds 
to actually send that data over from server, which is why it takes forever for that page to load. So a way to fix this is actually by adding React Suspense. What React Suspense allows you to do is you can stream in the content as it gets ready. So you can push content that is already available already to the client. And then once the new content or the slow content comes in, which is after 12 seconds, you can then load that data in. And one cool thing is you can also provide a fallback. So you can give it a fallback of loading. And now what this allows you to do is you can see loading right away. And while you're waiting for 12 seconds and the data is being compiled on the server, imagine this is a database call, you can at least still see React Flight Demo at the top and your page is not completely waiting. Cool. So, and then after 12 seconds, you see hello from server. This is streaming with the help of React Server Components and React Suspense. Now, why did we talk about all of this? We talked about all of this because this is powered by React Flight Protocol. So let's take a look at that. In my dev console, if I look at the doc and I give it a reload, you'll notice that as data starts coming in, I've got some data in here, which looks like this weird sort of chunks thing. Now, if you look at the response here, you'll notice that it has a loading thing here, which is just what I'm sending through my suspense fallback. But if you scroll down to the script tag, this is where you'll start seeing the chunks. Honestly, these are very hard to see and very hard to understand. So there's a really cool dev tool by Alvar Lagerlof, and this tool is called RSC Dev Tools. I'll leave a link to it in the description as well. But this tool actually lets you visualize React Server components and React flight protocol in a very easy to view way. So let's open that. I have actually already installed RSC Dev Tools. I'm going to open it. A great way to kind of test this is by changing some text in here and then rerunning this. So now you'll see that I've got another get request going. And if I click on this, you'll see that I've got some data coming in. This is actually really cool because I can look at the raw payload. This is exactly what is React Flight payload. So you'll see here that there are some symbols here. There's some I, which is actually referring to an import but what's important here to understand is that there is an ID and it will refer to a reference. Same way I and 29 and W actually refer to actual symbols for React. If you scroll all the way down in here, you'll notice that this is exactly where my data is. It says hello from the server after 12 seconds. And that is the data that I'm sending as part of this payload. So this is what you need to understand about React Flight payload, which is where it comes from. So React Flight payload comes from streaming responses, which comes from promises, which are in React Server components, by default part of Next.js. Okay, so one thing to remember about React Flight payload, payload, oh God mouthful is that it is not a standard. It is a new thing that's been created for React Server Components. And it's mostly to overcome the limitations that JSON has with streaming responses. JSON cannot stream responses. It cannot work with promises, which is why this protocol was created so that server can send a component and then React and client can deserialize that component. Now the React exploit happened in this React flight payload. So let's take a look at the POC. This is the payload that Lachlan sent and we're gonna dive deep into this payload to understand what's going on. If this feels like a lot of garbage to you, don't worry, we're gonna take a look at this in the next few minutes. Let's work on it line by line. First item here is zero, which represents to the zeroth chunk. This is zero, one, two, three, these are all chunks in React in this payload. So what this means is zero has this value, one has this value, two has this value, and so on. This is how chunks are represented. So React starts here. The dollar one sign actually references to the first chunk. So this is a reference to chunk one. Now in this chunk one, you'll see that the status is set to resolve model. This is actually very clever because remember that in promises, whenever the status is resolved, we actually want to take its value and execute that value, return that value. When you set it to resolve model, this actually tricks React into thinking that this is a promise object. And if you look at the then property, this is a thenable object, which means in JavaScript, anything that is thenable runs as a promise. So when React looks at this, it thinks, okay, this is a then, I should run its then. Now, when you look at its then property, you'll notice it references chunk two and it's then. And this is where things get complicated, so stay with me. It refers to chunk two, which is actually, watch this, a reference of at three, which actually means self-reference of chunk three. Oh my God, this is the thing that took me the longest to understand. So let's take a look at it to understand. Okay, so what it basically does is at the dollar sign is a reference. The at is a self-reference. So it's kind of like pointing to itself, but it's a self-reference of chunk three, which is an array. So what it means is that it actually returns a chunk wrapper of this object. Not this object. Remember, if it was $3, it would have returned the array, but it is actually a dollar at three. So it is a self 
reference. It's kind of like refer me the wrapper of whatever's in chunk three, which is the array. It's going to give you not the array, but the chunk wrapper of this array. Each of these are chunks, so it actually turns a chunk wrapper. Let me show you what that chunk wrapper looks like. This stuff took me like hours to understand, but hopefully you can understand it better from me. Okay, the chunk wrapper looks like this. All right, so now when at three, uh, or whatever this weird thing is, when this thing refers, it's actually returning this like weird chunk. But this is just an object. But what's important here is that it also has a thenable function. So it also looks like a promise. Okay, so, so far two returns this, this returns a chunk wrapper. Now this then, then points to the then of whatever is returned from here. Okay, so what does that mean? So this actually returns to I'm going to call this chunk wrapper three. Okay, so this dollar sign two slash colon then is a chunk wrapper dot threes then. Remember, this chunk actually has a then block, right? So now it actually turns this then block. So it's creating like a chain of promises. Second exploit, okay? So first exploit was that we're providing this like weird status thing and it looks like a promise code. And the second part of the exploit is that we're adding a then to a function that does not come from its own property. It's somebody else's property. It's up in the chain. Okay, so far so good. At this point, we've got the chunk wrapper dot then, okay? Now notice, even though this then is provided by the hacker, when you go chunk wrapper three dot then, this is actually legit React code. And at this point, React will respond back or resolve back with the value. So in the chunk three wrappers then block, this is how this get executed. What's important is that because chunk one is the one that called this then block, that this is sent to chunk one and the function that's executing is going to be chunk wrapper three dot then, which actually is this function. So it basically checks if this status is resolved model, which the hacker had maliciously set as resolved model. If the status is resolved model, process this value. So basically we compute this value, which in itself is another issue, then resolve these references by using this dot response and then sending that value. Okay. So let's take a look at this one by one. So what is this value? Var value equals JSON dot parse this dot value. If you look at this value, which is stored in this value provided in the first chunk, this actually itself looks like a JSON string. And it is made to look like an array by providing a length one. This is where things get very complicated. Now this actually has another than block which executes third references map. And then it further has another then block, which actually refers to $B3. This is an important part of this exploit. Okay, take a look. So $B actually means a blob in React, React Flight Protocol. So what this basically tells React is that the three chunk treat it as a blob. All right, so, so far so good, right? We've got the value, which actually is just a JSON string. And then the next part is to look at the response. B3 is actually the third blob. Dollar $B just means blob. Three just means ID. So it's actually referred to the third blob ID. We'll take a look at what that means in a second. But remember the next part of this denable code is we've got this value already done, which was a JSON string. Now we have to get a resolved value. So this we can get by using this dot response. This remember refers back to chunk one because that's the one that, that started all of this with the response and the value. So now we've got this response, which actually refers to the fourth reference, which is right here. This is a little weird, okay? So it's got this prefix, it's got form data, get chunks and whatever's going on here. This is a very tricky thing, so pay attention. So I'm gonna start with chunks actually, first of all. The reason this says chunks is because it makes React think that this is a valid code, okay? So notice how it points from $2, which is this guy and actually just the chunk wrapper saw this, and it actually points to its chunks. It's made here so that React can believe that this is a valid chunk. So it doesn't throw an error. Then the way this is executed is React looks at this and the then block actually signifies that whatever is in here is actually a blob. So React will treat this like a blob. Looking at this, React actually treats blobs this way. So React actually executes blobs this way. So it checks response.formdata.get response.prefix plus blob ID. This is why there was a response.prefix and I'm gonna show you why in a second, but blob ID, just remember, refers here to the blob ID we had, which was, uh, remember it was $B, Three. So the blob ID here is three. That's where this blob ID comes from. Now, this is a very clever trick in here. We're running response.formdata.get. All right. Now look at this. 
object. We've got response as fourth chunk. It has a form data, it has a get. So now when you call response.formdata.get, you're actually returning this value. And look at the craziest part. This is the reference to the third chunk, which is here, which returns constructor, which is actually an arrays constructor and its constructor, which is actually JavaScript's native function. So this actually is just a function. Now, why this is crazy is because we've got this prefix, we've got this console log, okay? Now we have this function, okay? So let's see what this evaluates to, okay? So what is the value of response.formdata.get? This is equal to function and this response prefix plus blob ID, this is a very clever trick. So you got response prefix, which was that console log thing. So this is console.log, it had seven times seven plus one, and then watch this. It also has this weird comment thing in here. Oh my God, the level of mastery in this is crazy. Okay, now this is actually a string, so it's just gonna be this. And then we've got plus blob ID. Blob ID, uh, we've got three. What does it totally return? So we've got function, we've got console log, and then we've got this like blob ID in here. So it is actually a plus, which means it concatenates string, which just means that it's actually just going to put this three right after this comment. And what is this? Executing a function on the server. Holy shit. This is crazy. This is pretty tricky. And honestly, it took me a while to understand. So hats off to Lachlan Davidson for even figuring this out. But this is what the exploit is. You're able to override thens and React is not checking if the then belongs to the object that is calling it or if it is being inherited from the top. So this is what has caused the React exploit. Now this is a visual overview of what this looks like. This diagram is by Wiz Research. I'm going to leave a link to it in the description as well. And by the way, if you want a link to the six quality draw, it's also going to be in the description. So here's what it looks like. We start at the top, which is deserialization of zero, which actually leads to chunk one. And then when we resolve chunk one, we notice that chunk one actually results to the response of the fourth chunk. Now this is where the trouble starts. So we've got chunk four, which actually has form data dot get, which points to three's constructors constructor, which is the function itself, which actually lets us execute function. The chunk force prefix holds malicious code, which is this console log, the actual code that we can execute with this common thing. And that actually helps to prevent React from throwing an error when it sees a weird blob ID. And then C4's chunks actually points to like a valid chunk, which causes React to not throw an error when it sees this weird chunk. We have this weird at ampersand three, which triggers value property promise chain. Remember this was a denable block, which is an actual valid denable block. And it leads to executing response for thing. So we've got innermost resolution, we find the blob here, B3. We execute form data dot get response prefix plus object, and this becomes chunk four dot form data dot get chunk four dot prefix object. When that executes, we actually have like a proper function running, and then we have this followed by the comment, which actually prevents React from throwing an error, and we have successfully executed a function. I love this visual overview. Hopefully, this makes it easy for you to understand what's going on. And the fix for this was actually to add has own property while calling the module itself, which is actually resolving these functions. But there's something to remember. There's actually two more vulnerabilities announced since the first vulnerability, the denial of service and source code exposure. So it is highly recommended that you update your app. The React blog actually mentions the versions that have the patch. So a new patch version has been introduced in 19.01 and 2, 19.0.1, 19.1.2 and 19.2.1. Similarly, if you're using Next.js, or React Router or Expo or Redwood SDK or Waku, you must update your plugins. And that is the most important thing from this video. So if this made sense to you, let me know in the comments what you thought about this React vulnerability. If this is still confusing to you, that's okay. It's totally normal. This is a pretty complicated vulnerability and I'm impressed by Lachlan Davidson who was able to report this. If you don't understand it, that's totally fine. Put in the comments what is your confusion and I'll try to explain it. But the biggest lesson from this is always sanitize inputs that the user is giving you always check that if the property that you're calling has its own property so that you can avoid the error where somebody can actually exploit the property because react lets you write onto objects and finally react server components is not a standard the directives are not a standard so i guess we need to do more testing thank you for watching this video if you like this if this made sense to you hit like button and click subscribe thank you